everyone. This is Pei Pei Zhou. I'm, the, I'm glad and super excited to be here. Uh, this is the first time I pay a formal visit to CMU, EC department, and also visit a lot of, uh, like, uh, uh, meet with a lot of uh, graduate students and undergrad students. And today I'm going to share the latest research from Michael Torn, composing heterogeneous accelerators for matrix multiply on Bursa AC field capture. A little story. I want to start with the story. So Charm is actually not the first Charm paper I published. It's the second Charm paper I published. The first Charm paper I published is the work that I've been working on since uh, 2012, when I was a graduate student at UCLA. At that time, we viewed the Charm prototyping on FPJ. That is uh, 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 the uh, course growing reconfigurable architecture. And uh, when I want to come up with a name, this name just pops out and then give me strength. So I want to carry this like a uh, tradition and then pass this thing to my student and then let's get another 10 years working. So this is a story. So a little bit of my education and also working experience backgrounds. I joined the University of Pittsburgh ECE department since 2021, uh, September. And before that, I spent two years in Shanghai. So after I spent seven years at UCLA as a CSL PhD student, I went back to China, Shanghai, you know, AI startup company, ASIC, uh, doing the fastest AI accelerators. I mean, fastest, literally, better than video GPU at that time. So, and uh, I served as a software engineer, and we uh, bring up all those uh, software stacks for two generations of AI chips. And uh, uh, this is a, like a, a fabulous experience for me. So then that's the time that we're, I realized and had a better understanding of programming abstraction and also application-driven architecture design. And uh, so 3A, to summarize my research, application, uh, abstraction, and also architecture. So I studied FPJ, AI ASIC, and also the performance analysis for GPU, and et cetera. That means NPU and memory encryption accelerator as well. And the abstraction means how we build the programming abstraction to ease the programming efforts when we want to build or bring this customized computing to the nowadays uh, different applications. And the applications, including this uh, medical and the genomics and, and also AI. And I also uh, offer several teaching uh, in PIT ECE department, including graduate course, reconfigurable computing in deep learning, uh, and that's a popular class, and the undergrad course, including the computer organization and architecture, and also embedded system design. So this is one of the platforms we have been working on. Uh, that is Linux Heterogeneous SOC, and that's also the one of the highlighted projects I want to bring up today. Okay, with that saying, thanks James for bringing up this best paper. I highlighted the best paper and the best paper nominees in this chart. This is uh, my past uh, publication experience. Uh, well, I cut this to three by three. So three includes the chip level, node level, and to the data center level. And the other three, including the vertical, uh, uh, from all the way abstraction, application to abstraction, and also architecture. So I mainly focus on how to bring this FPGA to this, uh, from the chip level to the data center level so that we can deploy this customized computing machine for big data applications, uh, machine learning application, and genomics applications. And uh, that's the past story. But I want to emphasize that after I joined PIT, we started to publish new papers. So this is uh, two uh, publications we have recently uh, managed to uh, do. The first one is FPT23. This is Chong, uh, where we uh, give this uh, presentation, uh, I think, in Montreal uh, two months ago. And also one in the coming uh, 60 years DAC design automation conference. And this is about this uh, high level programming abstraction we provided. So we provide this Python interface to use Chong. So that's the uh, incoming paper. And uh, hope. In the future, we can put more and more blocks into this uh, figure. And I can see, show you another figure in the future about another three by three. That's the uh, best hope. OK. So I have heard a lot of the debating on two things. One is FPG is dead. Another thing is long live the FPG. So why is that? And if we use some like representative computing platforms and show the energy efficiency here, so I put GPU and FPJ uh, as an apple to apple comparison here uh, uh, in using FP32 and integer 16 and also integer 8. And uh, if we see these four different computing platforms, two GPU, two FPJ, the first two GPUs are one is the data center GPU, 800, and another one is the Jetson 
that's the embedded GPU. And the, the FPGA includes the data center level AVI board. That's the, I would say this, uh, one of the largest FPGA using 2.5D Tulsa based design that we can put a very large device on this data center uh, FPGA board. And the latest one that's, I had it away, but I think you all know the answer already, which is disclosed by my title. So this X FPGA, that's pretend we don't know this, what is this X is. So this F FPGA, if we compare this energy efficiency among all these four different platforms, this XFPGA beats GPU 800. That's the latest GPU. I would say the seven nanometer GPU. And, uh, but before XGPU uh, is, uh, and before F XFPGA, the, when we use the heavier FPGA, actually the energy efficiency is not as good as GPU. So it's, I would say 10X. That's the difference, all the gap. The way I, I've been working on these platforms for many years, and I constantly question myself, what should I do? <laughs> and uh, what we should do to pitch FPGA in the future architecture? And that brings me new ideas as soon as I have a touch on this X FPGA. Well, we finally bring the energy efficiency to a level that's it's higher than GPU and higher than the FPGA only solution and also GPU only solution. And that's one data type. If we pitch this to integer 16 energy efficiency, sadly, these two platforms, they don't intrinsically support this data type in integer 16 and FPGA does. And if we go for integer eight, because this integer eight tensor cores has been like, uh, have been introduced into the GPU or MPU architecture, uh, in, particularly in this A100. So, 800 support this integer eight computation, but we still managed to beat the A100 energy efficiency by 1.9x. So suddenly, the answer flipped from FPGA is dead to long live the FPJ. But I will say the hidden secret should be explained clearly to you why we got this energy efficiency gateway and how we can elaborate this feature for the future applications. And uh, so some uh, this this is this is also another example where we have this FP32 end-to-end -end performance profiling on vision uh, on MLP. This is a multi-layer perception uh, for classification problem. So we managed to have 1.2x energy efficiency in terms of end-to-end -end performance. So that's significant because we have M dot four. If we are targeting an uh, end-to-end application, anything more than one is good because uh, you can accelerate easily on a certain kernel, right? but accelerating the whole application is much complex. So we should uh, have uh, an impression or new impression now is when we have this XFPG, we can fit the latest GPU, which is targeted for the AI or tensor-based computation by somehow. But uh, how is that possible, right? So this is a successful story. What is this XFPG? XFPG is the AMD Xilinx Versal ACAP, ACAP. So it is featured with a heterogeneous computing uh, uh, components within the same SOC, uh, which includes the ARM core and also FPJ, that's a programmable logic part. And what's the most important thing is the tensor core, uh, where we have the AI AC cores uh, that are specialized for AI or deep learning applications. So that's the what the Dynamics commercial or like the, I would say, uh, their Xilinx uh, team is uh, bragging about. I see it as a perfect platform for different kinds of applications. So med medical field applications, well, we need this uh, image processing and the AI inference in the post processing. I see potentials in this, uh, putting this in the data center for the recommendation system. How about we do something like in uh, microsecond acceleration for ChatGPT? And also seeing you know, the image recognition, where well, we can put this in the autonomous systems to do this real time, real low latency, which enable the high speed autonomous system and also the NLP, natural language processing. So I see so many different applications out of this board, out of this thing. So it should help me as they're like uh, uh, in their team to, 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 to accelerate the selling of this, uh, this uh, computing problem. But the thing is that, I have talked a lot about the successful story, but the, I want to give you also the beta story. So 
when we first touched uh, over SAP, we say, okay, that's good. From the manual, it is said that it can give us 6.4 teraflop floating point operations per second for FP32. We say, that's great. Vision Transformer, perfect example. We can put, put this design on this platform and then let's do a design with one teraflop operations. But after a few months, what we get? Can you guess? Okay, let's give me the answer. It's 49.5. So that's around like 100x yeah, from the theoretical uh, advertised performance. And then we identify the problem and then we identify the bottlenecks within this implementation. And we carefully design char with composing heterogeneous accelerators um, versus for matrix modification. And what is the updated performance? Off time, we got 1.6 teraflop. We bring back the performance and improve it for 32.5x. What's the magic? It turns out the magic is already put here. So when we take a closer look at the vision transformer computation kernels, there are different shapes of matrix multiply. And there are larger matrix multiply, but we also have so many series of uh, smaller matrix multiplication kernels, which is as small as 64 by 64 by 64. It's a pile of this small matrix computation. It's the bottleneck when we first apply matrix computation composition on Versa. How we solve that? So let's go take into a look at this Versa ATAP architecture together. So this is an overview. We said that this is a heterogeneous platform. So we have ARM, GPU system, process system, general purpose. And we have the programmable logic. This is a PL part. We, are, we have the CLB, BRAP, BRAP, DSP. And also, we have the AIE. This is an AI tensor force array. How many we have for that? We have in total 400 of them. And you can think of each one of it as a tensor for matrix multiplication kernels, accelerated, hardened accelerated kernels. And how we can put this system together as an accelerator for the end to end applications. Well, there are so many different choices and the flexibilities, like how we partition the different kernels on this PL, how we partition on this AIE array, how we partition for through the, some of the kernels in the process system, right? Now, how we leverage this, this is an on chip interconnect, bandwidth, 1.2 terabytes per second. And here is an off chip. That was only 25.6 gigabytes per second. So we only have like one DR dam here. And how we can leverage this system. And uh, one more thing to be added here. So for the AI core, this is a real IW. So very long instruction word. And uh, you can kind of like issue six different kinds of uh, uh, instructions within one long instruction. Because one long instruction is uh, 128 bits. So we can have different subfields of this instruction, so you can load the data in the first instruction and then load another batch of data in second instruction at the same time to the computation. So as long as we instruct this uh, fully packed all these uh, long instructions, you know, very careful way, we can have a fully pipeline design in this very wide of the core. So there are so many different, uh, so many challenges in designing uh, applications mapping on this uh, platform. The first thing is the mismatch of this huge computation intensity or uh, theoretical performance versus the limited off-chip bandwidth. So if we profile this two uh, in terms of this uh, theoretical performance and also the off-chip bandwidth for three different generations of FPJ, including the 28 nanometer, 16 nanometer, and also the latest one, the seven nanometer, what do we have? So in this left chart, we show the performance. So we have higher and higher performance from 28 nanometer FPJ to 7 nanometer FPJ. So there are 15 X gap of, uh, between this 28 nanometer and 7 nanometer. And what about the option bandwidth? Versa has the lowest option bandwidth among the three generations. So it's very surprising that number is very small. Very small. So, if we have uh, some background about these roofline models for this uh, computation versus communication analysis, 
we know that as uh, if we have a, a smaller like uh, of chip bandwidth, we need to hugely reuse the data on chip so that we can uh, eliminate all those excessive uh, of chip bandwidth access rate. So this means that we had a really big challenge. We want to deny high performance uh, deny on this person because it has the slowest of chip DRAM but with the highest thread performance. So another uh, question is that how we program this uh, heterogeneous system? We have the processing system, ARM core, right? We have uh, the PL part, that's the IPG part, and we have this BLI W core. And uh, how we program that? That's hard. But uh, before we dive into this programming, I know we want to program right away. Let's do a tutorial next time. But uh, let's talk about how we map this matrix modification with this uh, architecture. So let's say we have a matrix with large size. And uh, this large size cannot be on the on chip RAM. How we do that? We do tidy plan. We cut this matrix to smaller tiles and feed these tiles onto the PL. That's the programmable logic part. So we're loading this left-hand side matrix, loading the right-hand side matrix, put that in the program, programmable logic part, and then this programmable logic part serves as the on-chip reuse buffer. And then from this on-chip reuse buffer, we feed the data from the smaller tiles to these AIE. So we do this iteratively until all the sub-tiles within this reuse buffer has been fully computed. And then we get a tile result of the scene. And then we do this for another big tiles. And then we bring that into the on chip buffer and then cut them to smaller tiles, send the data to AIE, get the data from back to AIE, and then finish all the computation. So that's the, how we can get huge data reuse and high performance when we map a large matrix size onto Versa. That's good. That's probably the case or the behind the reason we can probably get closer to 6.4 terraflow pinpoint operation. That's when we have a large matrix size, when we have enough data reuse and we fully reuse all those uh, on chip buffer. But what if like we have this small matrix? We have a small matrix, 64 by 64 by 64, not 4K by 4K by 4K. If I ask you for a project, class project, just give me a design right away. What is your design strategy? Do you change your Excel code or you change the whole scope? What is your strategy? If I ask you to do, let's do a mapping in, let's say 30 minutes, we just change the host code, right? We change the host code, padding all the data to from 64 to 4K, and then use the same accelerator, that's a unified accelerator. Actually, a lot of like papers, they are discussing using unified accelerators, which is like one single accelerator to accelerate all those different kernels within a system for end-to-end -end applications. That's the bottleneck. If we do this way, we are wasting so much. We are wasting on this DRAM bandwidth because we're bringing unnecessary data, which we mark here as the red block. We only need the red small box, but we bring in all those red unnecessary data. We're also wasting all those unnecessary computation on AI already, which is also marked in the red box. That's the embedded computation. So the, how we solve this, because this application is not defined by us. The application is developed by the algorithm or application engineers, right? And they are, yeah. So this is a huge computation resource versus MM layers of small sizes. Not to say how we use all of these 400 AIE arrays and route them and then place them there and give us a design. If we use one accelerator, we use all of them, we cannot avoid this waste. So if we plot this one monolithic accelerator, unified accelerator, to uh, plot this uh, uh, performance and also uh, the matrix size, if we sweep this matrix size from 64 to 128 and then 256 all the way to 3K, we see an increase in this performance. That's obvious, right? That's we have a higher utilization of all these uh, uh, accelerators. And uh, we want this A point. But the fact is that some kernels, 
they sit in B point. And I heard some hidden thoughts in your mind already. Can we do some other things to elevate this uh, B point, this very small like, utilization? But the answer is, it depends. It depends on this application or the algorithm yeah, itself. Do we have this uh, reuse or fuse kernel patterns within this application? The answer is no, not in this application. So the vision transformer, all these like smaller like chain, they are not in chains. Sorry for the uh, um, mistaken information. They are not in the chains, they are in parallel. So all these smaller matrix, they are in parallel. We cannot stream any data from between among them. No. So no data we use. If we have any like a, a pipeline of data uh, like data flow uh, within this uh, application, then we can explore that. Also a very good proposed idea is that if we can, let's say, fit all those weight, all those parameters within a chip, we don't have to bring in all the time, right? We just uh, feed or send the input data and then get the output data. We cannot, we don't need to load this weight. But now we have the assumption that this model is large enough. It's larger than these, uh, the weight is larger than the on-chip resource. So we have a, like there's a structure. If all the, if this uh, application or model is smaller than threshold, then good. If it's lower than the threshold, then we have to suddenly pay 10x more time on bringing the data. We are now in this region, larger than the threshold, but also a good answer because that's how we use uh, the Microsoft Catapult project to accelerate a big thing using tens of different FPGA so that the threshold is bigger and we can fit the models in. Good answer. Okay. This is a closer to uh, the uh, Linux uh, uh, AI, various AI solution. So they have smaller tiles, but they also put smaller accelerators. So they put eight duplicates accelerators within the system. So smaller accelerator means waste less. That's how VDC AI is done. So VDC AI exactly is designed like this. So they put eight different duplicate accelerators on the system so that we have a smaller accelerator design. We don't have to bring that huge matrix. We just bring one eighth of the previous size and then we waste less. So we bring back this B to certain uh, like a point, like into a C point, which is uh, about like 10, like 8X more than B. But the downside of this design is that if every accelerator is smaller, then we cannot fully utilize all those previews when the matrix size is longer. So we have a slightly higher when the matrix size is smaller, but we have slightly smaller or lower performance when the matrix size is large. We want to get the both sweet points from the both end. So one monolithic design is not good. Eight duplicate accelerated design is not good. That motivates us to do composing diverse accelerators. So that's the behind reason and main motivation how we design these accelerators in different shapes. So the key idea is that we can design a matrix, sorry, we can put this uh, accelerator into two parts. The first part is accelerator zero, which consumes most of the resource of this platform, more AIEs, more PL, more DDR benefits being allocated to this one. And then they are targeted only the large matrix size. And then for the second accelerator, accelerator one, it takes smaller sizes of AIE, smaller resources on PO, smaller resources on the off-chain bandwidth, but we map the only smaller sizes matrix onto those one. And if we have some parallel passes within this application so that we can put this parallel execution accelerators running at the same time, then we can do this and uh, issuing this uh, parallel uh, uh, models running. And then both of them can accelerate this part of this uh, graph at the same time. So that's how we do charm architecture. So that's the main accelerator architecture. Okay. Is that the, the, the computation use different accelerator needs to be independent? There's no dependency between them. But in your application, you have a lot of this kind of situation. That the kernels are dependent. So if they are independent, yeah. If they have dependency, then some one accelerator needs to wait another one. Yeah. So how we 
wow, you are you are you're reading my paper. So <laughs> okay, so how we solve this is this: we can pipeline this data batches so that we can overlap the second batch, the uh, prior kernels, which is uh, later batches, the later kernels together. So that's how we award these XR one data to another kernels uh, or another nodes within the same graph that has a dependency. Still, at the same time, this uh, another accelerator is working on the next batch, so they are overlapping each other. That's how we improve the overall system support. That's good. Yeah. So we 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 kind of like increase the size of the graph by duplicating batches. Okay. Yeah. This is the part where we, as a programmer, we want to solve and eager to solve. Right. We have this uh, three different. Heterogeneous genius so like uh, system computing uh, parts and how we program that. So AIE, they actually uh, Linux provide this API intrinsics uh, in C, and then we can issue this uh, uh, API to give let's say uh, one vector matrix modification in one single cycle, and then also provide this load instructions, vector load, vector store, or vector like shift some of, the, of these operations for you. But still, that's a large, uh, a lot to learn, right? And uh, we have this uh, some like uh, lines of code providing for the for our debug. So this uh, AIE C or C plus plus need at least write nine hundred lines of code to get a pretty good like single kernel design. And for this hello sense C or C plus plus, one dollar is not enough. We usually write the like uh, carefully design the DMA hello uh, sense in more than one thousand lines of code, right? And this one is the postcode where we uh, pack this data and then give this input data for the first layer and we get the result of the last layer and also send multiple batches of data. And also that needs efforts, right? That uh, prevents uh, a lot of uh, large adoption of this uh, computing platforms. We want to ease the programming of this. So that's how we deny charm. So the charm is uh, designed to solve all these three different challenges and we give the solutions by open source. So we design this charm as a programming framework so that we can generate these thousands lines of code automatically from high level description. And we open source this in our, like, uh, uh, this is my research group GitHub. Now this repo has 41 stars. Welcome to start and uh, you're welcome to put any like uh, pull requests or ask questions. We are online. 24/7. So this solution, the white box open source framework, and because uh, we have students, incoming students, as in another like time zone, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the challenge of chip bandwidth doesn't scaling as fast as computation. So we explore this uh, uh, on-chip reviews automatically by using nice space exploration, and also the high parallelism makes one size fits for all solution depends. So we explore how many accelerators we should put in the system and how we partition the resource among all those different accelerators. So these are all included in Charm framework. So Charm compilation takes three different inputs. To make it general, we can, uh, using by using these three different inputs, we can uh, theoretically uh, give this uh, compile the design for any AI models. Uh, so we need to give a feed uh, charm with this AI models describing in XML. So that's the first version. We can we, uh, we are developing in using Python like uh, some APIs to view these AI models so that we can integrate with PyTorch or TensorFlow or AI model, right? And the, the other thing is the DDR profiler. The, the idea is that this is not just for VCK 190. That's the one of the board we have. What about the other uh, platforms like? HPM enabled versa, or this VCK 5K, which has four different DDR. And what about this VC70? That's a mobile, uh, like a single one U, like this size versa platform. And also with another uh, set of uh, different hardware resources. So we put all this uh, hardware abstraction away, give it as a constraint to this uh, framework, and Tom will give the output as the source code including the source code for the AIE, source code for the hello senses, uh, for the FPJ, and also the source code for the postcode. And we can compile this by using vendor provided to various AIE and also the model, generate the XLV and also the X, uh, EXE, the postcode, deploy that on person. 
actually we put this one little silver in the research lab now so that we can assess this machine by using a Raspberry Pi as a jumper silver so that uh, all those students can access it remotely. They don't have to bring this board to their computers and then program it and then give it to another student. No, we do time multiplexing all the time. So that's why it's sitting on the internet. So charm, uh, it uh, consists of four parts. So the first part is a single accelerator device based exploration. Second one is how we compose by using this uh, single accelerator DSE. The third one is that we need to use the runtime configuration to enable this uh, multi-batch computation. And also the last one is that the automatic code generation is the programming and uh, that's the whole design framework. So this uh, single accelerator design spaces for reason, the key idea, I think this is a, this is a part well, uh, uh, most of you probably have uh, experience of and uh, also have your own research topics. And uh, this covers all those things on how we uh, design this AIE processor, how we design this IO, sorry, PL, PL programmable logic to reuse this IO, as how we do this buffer on chip buffer allocation. And uh, this is just uh, some code examples. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. We just look at the first three lines of code. So if we are given these three lines of code, which specify this single AIE computation shapes, then we can generate the code afterward. So three lines of code defines this left hand side matrix size, right hand side matrix size. That's it. And we provide this single AIE computation efficiency. When we increase this uh, smaller, sorry, when we increase the matrix size from uh, eight by eight by eight to six to four. Sorry, 32 by 32 by 32, then we have increased this uh, performance efficiency from 64% to 94. So that's a fully pipeline, almost fully pipeline uh, VLIW code or assembly code we have. But so this assembly code is abstracted using C intrinsic. So we're writing C and they generate in some code and then we profile using AIE simulator and then capture the exact cycle needed for this combination. So this is cycle effort. We compile it to prior work, uh, which is published in MPL uh, 22, that accelerate this uh, graph convolutional network. So we reported their single kernel uh, efficiency as well. So we improved from 30% to uh, 73, 73% for certain shapes. And also for this one, we got like uh, increase from 45% to 9%. And when we have this very good single AIE, it does not necessarily mean that we have a good design when we scale up, right? Scaling up means that we have to put this, uh, we have to scan the data or collect the data from all those different AIEs. How we can do that? There are only limited numbers of IOs between these AIE and between the PL and the AIE. Let's say we only have, just an example, let's say we only have 79 this ports between the PL and the 400 AIE. How we can use this 79 ports by feeding 400 AIE? The key idea here is the broadcast and the packet switch mechanism provided by the uh, that is uh, this uh, platform. That is, we can time multiplexing this single port, and also we can broadcast the data. So if we broadcast the data, it means that the same piece of data is sent to four different, let's say in this example, four different destinations. So they only occupy one port. And if we do time multiplexing and scatter the data, so scatter means different parts of the data to different destinations, right? And this one, we can do four, we can send four parts, four different data uh, segments to four different destinations by still using one port. And how we combine, we can combine them together. If we combine them together, we can send, we can use one port to send data to 16 AIE. So that's how we do broadcast and package switch. So in timing multiplexing and also broadcast, by using one port, we send the data to 16 different AI. So that's how we managed to use this 79 IO ports to feed the data to all those 400 different AI. So that's the, some of this switching and also the replacement. I hear some like details here, but uh, you're more than welcome to discuss with me how we map this device. We have some manual, mapping strategy and we want to automate this so that we don't need to specify which AIE serves as which part of this communication. So that's ongoing. 
So with the DSE, DSE is a way for us to better explore this uh, design and uh, give us some like uh, idea on what's the estimated uh, performance and uh, resource usage before we even implement this. Right? So single accelerator DSE takes into this uh, model size and also the platform hardware configurations into as an input. And then we can give out this accelerator that achieves the highest throughput. Actually, we can give a set of different uh, uh, like accelerators, all good answers, near optimal. So that's the single accelerator design. So give me a set of layers, give me a resource partition, I can give you a good design. That's the base of how we explore diverse composition. We need the single accelerator DSE first. And then with the single DSE accelerator, we can compose that to do diverse accelerator composing. And the key, the, the, the problem is formulated as how we assign n layers in one accelerator models to n different accelerators, right? This is a problem formulation. And if we have this uh, in a naive search or like a exhaustive search, then we know that for, if we have M layers, then M mapping these M layers, we have N different flexibility. And if we have N layers, we will have N times N times N and N times uh, all the way like to the M. So that's exponentially uh, complex. We don't want this. How we accelerate the searching? Well, as we observe that, we can first uh, sort all those layers by operations. We know we have some large layers, right? We have smaller size layers. If we sort them, then we can partition these layers in segments. So we first sort this uh, matrix by the operation, total operations. And then we set this in as a hyperfactor. Let's say, now I want to explore what's the best configuration we can get. We have only one accelerator. Then I explore and mix two, and then I explore and mix three. Four, five, six, seven, and until some some part I see no increase at all, then I can stop search. Right, so that's how we do manage to do so. So let's say we use five layers and two accelerators as example, and then we first cut this segment. Sorry, cut this five layers by assigning the first four layers to the first accelerator and the last one to the next one to the second accelerator, because we have the single accelerator explorer. Right, we have the single ESE. I feed this one to the single accelerator DSE and says, okay, if for four accelerator one partition, what is the performance here? So it says, okay, 2.5 T. And the next one says 0.4. So overall we have 1.8. That's one design if we have cut this to four one. But if we cut this to three two, if we have combined this four first three layers in one accelerator and the last two as in uh, the second accelerator, we do the same analysis again. And the overall circuit is 2.0. So this is higher than the previous one. So this one becomes the better one. So we iterate this, we explore 2, 3, 1, 4, probably all the way through this uh, nine. And then by using this two step search algorithm, we can find this uh, better design along the search. So that's, that's, how, that's how we use this single DSE to do this diverse accelerator composing and find the best uh, model. So here we report some of this single accelerator design experiment result. We first report how we compile to the PL itself on the same platform. So this AIE is the ASIC course and the PL is the programming logic core. And the throughput wise, if we only need the PL, then that's not, that's about like 5.5 X if we use PL plus AI engine. In terms of the energy efficiency, the gap is 2 X, around like 1.9 X. Also to show some like uh, accuracy of our device-based exploration, the, our model gives almost like 95% accuracy compared to the measured on-chip uh, onboard implementation result. So we are good with this DSE model so that we can search this result in 170 seconds for a large AI model. So in terms of the applications, we study four representative applications which are matrix modification intensive. The first one is BERT large, second one is vision transformer, and then the neural collaborative filtering for the recommendation and also multi-layer perception. So we use the same visualization method to characterize the shape of variance. This one is a BERT, 
we have large layers, we have smaller layers, and we, this one is a larger shape variant for VIT. And here we have probably the NCM and the MLP, they have larger layers dominate the applications. So with these four different characteristics, uh, like representative applications, we have this different throughputs on their different composing policy. So we set this, uh, we show this four different policies. One is one monolithic, one is one specialized. Well, the difference is that when specialized, we do NS1 to search for the good answers. And uh, we have also shown the two diverse, also the A duplicate, these four different policies. Among these four different policies, the first two applications, they show greater or bigger shape variance, right? So the two diverse pops out as the best. Two diverse pops out the best. And the, the gap between the one model is it can be two diverse is larger when we have larger shape variance. So this one is like VIT is 33x, and for bird it's like 5x. VIT has a larger shape variance, so we have a bigger improvement. And for the MCF and MLP, they're pretty good because they have a larger measure size. The one specialized or one analyze is pretty much the same performance, but still we want to use charm to double confirm this, right? And it turns out this search result, yes, that's the best. So that's the super wise. So for birds, and then the end to end applications, we achieve 1.46 tarot flops. Uh, and uh, for VIT, that's uh, 1.61 tarot flops. And for NCF, we got 1.74, and for MLP, we got almost three uh, T tarot flop operations. So we finally approach 50%. Okay, because okay, that's, uh, that's hard. This is a, just a, a show about this chip layout. Okay, where's AIE? Where's PL? Any guess? So we have this uh, left bottom part, which is dark, no use, that's where arm core is. And the, the highlighted parts are the non-matrix kernels we implement in these end-to-end -end applications. We also implement this uh, softmax, transpose, layer now, and also the DMA for these matrix modifications. And AIE consumes only almost one sixth of the chip time, but it gives five X over the PL. That's the basic tensor model. And that's the architecture overview of how we partition this uh, resources. We have this uh, non measurement modification kernels, we have this matrix modification kernel, and also talk to the ER. Okay, so with that saying, I think uh, I'll conclude today's uh, uh, talk. So we have uh, these uh, composed uh, like uh, heterogeneous accelerator on first ACP, but this is just a starting point. Looking ahead, we have other applications. Think about this. The GPU says we are good in AI, and then we have a platform that's better than AI and GPU. And also we have programmable logic that is better in any kinds of application, basically. I think we are good in using this platform to accelerate almost any applications in the future. How about homomorphic encryption? How about this, uh, let's say, medical uh, pipeline where we have this image processing as a pre processing step, and also the AI as a million, also some like actuality uh, action, like in the post processing part, how we combine them to a uh, real medical device, right? These are all open research discussions. So I hope that uh, uh, you, you, you have some like takeaways about how we use this heterogeneous system for different applications. And uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you. For this one, this is a well. We have this uh, QR QR code. So one is the uh, lab website. One is the uh, GitHub. One is the ACM link. By the way, we are the number one downloaded paper in MPJ 23 this year. So this is a collaborative work with the uh, UCLA, UIUC, AMD, Linux Research, and it's funded by uh, University of Pittsburgh's new FP startup. Grant and also NSF grants. Thank you.